Mehbooba Siraj, somebody who's been such a long-standing advocate for women's and child's rights. What do you make of uh, Taliban saying women can come back to work, women uh, can be in government, that they don't want to stop women and girls from studying and being out outside the house? Do you think this is a Taliban that's reformed from what we saw in the past? Is that even at all possible? Or is this just a facade to try and seek some kind of international legitimacy at this moment? Mehbooba Siraj? <laughs> Let me put that same question to Rakesh Sood, who's been our ambassador to Afghanistan, understands the lay of the land. Are we genuinely seeing a new Taliban? Or do you think, sir, this is just temporary till they fully entrench themselves in power? Well, I think as both Lisa and David have said, uh, we don't know the answer. The fact is that Pakistan has, for 20 years, given them safe haven, given them sanctuaries, and they have also found a number of what Lenin used to call useful idiots. That was the phrase Lenin had for uh, sympathetic people in the West. And I think uh, the Pakistanis found a number of useful idiots among uh, a lot of academics in the West who also wanted to show that there was a Taliban 2.0. And eventually, the rest of the world accepted this legitimization, which began with the opening of the international office in Doha. It took another step forward with the direct negotiations between the U.S. and the Taliban uh, when Ambassador Khalilzad undertook his mission to deliver a deal under the Trump administration. Nobody really knows whether the Taliban have changed or not because their statements have been delightfully vague and ambiguous. So I think we will have to wait and see whether or not the Taliban are different from what they were in the 1990s or whether they are just the same, slightly more media savvy, slightly more used to the conference circuit because they've now, their public face is the one that we've been seeing of the Taliban negotiators out of Doha. But let's not forget one thing, and I think that is important. There is, unlike the 1990s when there was a unified command under Mullah, today you have different groups. You have the fighters on the ground who are the ones who've actually done the fight. You have the international negotiators out in Doha, like Mullah Brother and uh, Stanikzai. And you have the Quetta Shura, which is headed by uh, Mullah Haibatullah. You have the two deputy leaders. One is Mullah Yaqub, who has been overseeing the military operations, particularly in the south. He's the son of Mullah Omar. And you have um, Sirajuddin Haqqani, the head of the Haqqani network, uh, who's also a deputy leader for whom, to the best of my knowledge, the U.S. still has a bounty of uh, five million or ten million dollars. So, and then you have all the other terrorist groups that are operating, ranging from Lashkar-e Toiba, Jaisher Muhammad, Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan, ETIM of the Uyghurs the IMU of the Uzbeks, and so on. So there are a number of these uh, people who are all there, and of course the Al-Qaeda. The Al-Qaeda have not uh, disappeared, and if you look at the most recent reports that have been given by the UN sanctions monitoring team, as also by the US Special Inspector General, it makes it very clear that the links between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban remain intact. Okay. So how does this power sharing work out in the future? Who determines what? That is what is going to determine the shape of Taliban 2.0. We may just find that it's a slightly more repackaged, more media savvy version of Taliban 1.0. They may have their own anchors, they may have their own reporters, but this is still sure. the Taliban. Ambassador, Alice.